Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy any investment based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research. Okay, good morning and welcome to the midweek takeaway. Yes, it's a different voice. Phil's normally the introducer, but uh, sadly some dentist has just attacked his mouth for 40 minutes. So uh, he has one less tooth now and he's not very happy. So uh, yes, so I welcome uh, Julian Stevens and Sapan Gear here for uh, for this podcast to talk to us about sovereign metals and uh, what's happening. So welcome Julian and welcome Sapan. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having us on. Hi, Kevin. You're very welcome. And we've had SAP on, on a few times before. So but so we're going to be asking you most of the questions, Julian. So tell us uh, how it. how this all happened. We'll, we'll, go, uh, we'll I guess... go back a few years and tell us how it all happened. <laughs> You're asking for the short version here because the, the long version is very long. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway, look, um, Sovereign is a uh, mineral exploration company. And we operate in Southern Africa in the country of Malawi, which, you know, being, you know, uh, British, you probably know, it's a smaller Southeast African country. And we have been historically exploring for graphite in Malawi. And uh, in our travels about four or five years ago, we discovered this mineral uh, called rutile. And rutile, rutile happens to be the purest natural form of titanium. And that... Uh, is used for uh, a number of uses, but the key uh, key or major market is pigment. Basically, titanium replaced pigment in paint. And so any white paint that you see, anything that's coloured white, uh, your colleague who's at the dentist today might be having some uh, uh, titanium attaining filling put into his uh, his mouth. You know, those all of those products use, use this mineral, so a very, very important mineral, and it happens to be... I guess, in a um, significant deficit in the market right at the moment. Very good. So how did you end up getting a project in Malawi from Australia? I mean, actually, I was with a gentleman this week from Malawi uh, in oh, Egypt. So he's studying here in Egypt and he's from Malawi. So that that's quite a – there can't be that many people in Malawi. How was the population in Malawi? Oh, uh, it's not small. It's something about 16 million Okay, so it's not small, yeah, right? Yes, not small. And and also the uh, was it the president or the UN representative of uh, Malawi? It was the president of Malawi in the UN there. I think uh, we he, saw some information. In 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 fact, uh, yes, at in the president's address, uh, he mentioned uh, our uh, Rutile project, which does happen to be. The largest deposit in the world. He uh, mentioned it in at the U.S. General Assembly last week. So we were we were um, very delighted to receive that that shout out from from the president. And this this project as well will be quite important for the Malawi economy. Um, you know, significant forex, significant tax receipts for the government, and a significant number of jobs and and training made available. Yeah, in Malawi, the main uh, the main export was uh, was it diamonds? Uh, did I read, or is it is that no, no, no? Uh, it, it's mainly an agricultural country. Uh, in terms of mining, they do have a uranium mine, but that happens to be on care and maintenance at the moment, so in operation, but it has been built. Uh, if the uranium price improves, that may start up again at some stage. Okay, so going back to the first question, how on earth did you get to Malawi to find this? It's like well, again a long story. <laughs> I'm a geologist, and uh, I've I've been working in Africa the vast majority of my career. Actually, you'll you'll actually find quite a quite a few Aussie geologists knocking around various parts of Africa. So I started working for for a different company, uh, um, not not Sovereign, something like 17 years ago. And uh, then, then decided that uh, looking for uranium actually, and um, but then a, uh, about twelve years ago, I decided to go out on my own with a couple of partners privately, and at that point, graphite was becoming a um, interesting mineral. So we originally went to Malawi looking for graphite, and uh, in our travels about four or five years ago, we discovered this uh, 
this uh, huge uh, root oil deposit. So from the perspective of uh, when you set up the company, mm-hmm. what sort of uh, everybody's very interested in how much skin in the game you have. So how much do you own <laughs> of, of this company? And obviously well, you discuss yeah. partners. So there's a few of you still. Yeah. So, so I had some, um, look, myself and my partners, we vended, uh, it was a private company. We vended it to Sovereign Minerals about, uh, Sovereign Metals, I should say, about 10 years ago after we had pegged the ground and done some work ourselves. Collectively, we probably own about eight or nine percent still. Obviously, we've been we've been, you know, diluted by numerous capital raises over the years. How did you find this thing in Malawi then? You were looking yeah. for the graphite and then yes, you found we this? Exactly. So we're looking for graphite and one day we uh I was looking at some graphite tailings. Um, the, the tailings are basically the waste material uh, once once the mineral has been processed. And uh, I was looking at the chemical uh, results or chemical assay results on these tailings, and they were high in titanium. And I thought that that high titanium might indicate that that the mineral rutile was present. And we did some more work on that, and we actually discovered that in fact it was rutile, so quite valuable but uh, not in enough uh, quantity in that in that particular area in that in that graphite deposit. So we decided uh, there was a good indication of rutile there. So we decided to 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 uh, look further afield, 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers, 50 kilometers away. And after uh, a couple of false starts as 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 happens in uh, mineral exploration, we uh, we came along a, a very, uh, high grade and extensive uh, area of rutile mineralization. Okay, so you you found a small bit and then obviously started looking slightly further. Yeah, so and... so look, the the small bit basically gave us the idea. That's when yeah. the, the 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 ding, the light bulb, the light yeah. bulb went off off in our collective heads, and we went, well, if this small amount is here, and we know we have the same geology up the road there, maybe. There's a larger amount up there, and and our our hypothesis at the time, our our hopeful hypothesis at the time, actually uh, turned turned true, and and actually beyond our wildest dreams, yeah. uh, what they what they could have been at the time when we thought when we had the idea, you know. Yeah, I mean, all the studies that have been done so far are only for a very small part of this um, resource. I take it. So, give us an idea of how much you've tested and, and the values that have been taken from that part of the, the resource? Yeah, so we have, uh, as I said, it's currently the largest rutile deposit in the world, probably two and a half times the size of the next biggest one. Uh, in our the current studies, only looking at about 30% of, of that, and that's because that 30% already will supply about 25 or 30 years of production. So we don't really look, when we do our economic models and things like that, we don't really look past about 30 years because it has no effect on, on the economic model. So you, you can, you, you know, you can see that this could be a 50, 75 or 100 year mine life with that, with that mineral resource we have in the ground there. And that, that also being said, we have not finished exploration. So, in fact, it's certain that it will grow larger. But that's not our focus at the moment. Our focus is getting these uh, technical studies completed, a feasibility study, and getting finance and, and getting this thing to an operating rutile mine. So you said also that uh, there is a deficit of rutile in the world. Um, and we've talked, I think, with Safan before as well about synthetic rutile and yes. the the economic, uh, not economic, environmental cost of producing the uh, synthetic is extremely negative, whereas obviously the rutile is is not. So, is this going to be enough to suffice the world, if you like, or are we still just uh, you know a small drop in the in the ocean in terms of what is required? <laughs> It, it, it actually is a small, even though it's so large, it's actually a small drop in the ocean compared to, to what is required. It, this large deposit of rutile will certainly assist the titanium industry uh, to bring its carbon footprint down because it, and particularly in the pigment component of the industry, because it, it will actually displace some of those dirtier alternatives that you spoke about that require either smelting or, or heating at, at high heat 
uh, and using uh, power and generating a lot of waste as well, plus carbon units. So it will replace some of those, but it's just not big enough to replace all of that feedstock for for the titanium uh, industry. Yeah, so give us an idea, again, just to remind people, this titanium oxide would be used by who? You know, what companies are going to be buying it? And, uh, okay. you know, because I, I presume this stuff does not work the same way as a, a copper market or a gold market where we have a spot price every day and da 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 da, da. It's, it's you to the end user pretty much, I, I think, anyway. Sure, sure. So it's it's an industrial mineral and it is about... For Rutol, about 60% would be sold, likely to be sold to the pigment industry that, that I spoke about. Those contracts would likely be long-term contracts, maybe three or five-year contracts, and you'd have an agreed price uh, for those contracts. The companies, the, the pigment producers or likely pigment producers that would buy this material, the likes of it, and you may not have heard of these, these guys, but Tronox, uh, Kronos, and the, the, their customers are the likes of a, a paint maker, someone like DuPont or, or, or someone like that. And or um, it's used in cosmetics as well. It's used in, in, in plastic, in the plastics industry. Any white plastic you see will have some titanium uh, pigment in it. The other use for rutile is in the welding industry. So about 30% of the rutile market is for welding. It's used as the flux in welding rods. And it can't be replaced. You can't replace rutile in welding rods with anything else. And, and the final use, of course, is um, in the production of titanium metal. Titanium metal, of course, being used in aerospace, uh, so aeroplanes, military applications and uh, medical applications, for example, uh, synthetic uh, joints or knee replacement or hip replacement or something like that. So a number of um, significant uses for, for this important mineral. Very good. A good a good view. There are lots and lots of industries that need this, so you're not just uh, focused on uh, one industry. No. And if that industry falls down, you're in trouble. There's going to be a lot of, exactly. Uh, a exactly. lot of variety there. So tell me a little bit about um, the share price then. I mean, uh, I was looking at it the last few days. Mm -hmm. You know, we're at, we're at 20p. We I think we hit a high into the... 40s or 50s you know what has happened did you lose did you, did. did you did you lose this retail deposit somewhere <laughs> no not 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 at all so so look two, two two things have happened i guess you know those peaks in our share price were around the time uh we released the the uh, mineral resource estimate when we told the world we had the largest retail deposit in the world since then obviously we've seen a significant deterioration in the market as as a whole and we have, you know, moved into that study phase, which for some people is less exciting and, and they'd rather punt on, you know, mineral exploration discoveries. So that 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 really, really would be the reasons that we, we've seen this um, share price fall off. But I would say it's, uh, you know, very good value now, out there right now, very good value in the in the 30s. Yeah. I, I, sorry, I, I talk about that in, in the... In the yeah, in, no, that was in that the was the point. Sense. Sorry, in 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 the in the twenties, in the in the P's, very good value. Yeah, and that that's the point I was also going to make is that this is ASX listed as well as, yeah, UK listed. Yes, so, um, you have uh, shareholders on both sides. Have you had any idea what sort of percentages we've got in terms of uh, Australian holders to uh, UK holders? So, look, we have, uh, it, it is Australia dominated, probably about 60%, and the other 40% is European, probably about 30% of that is in Germany, and about 10% is in the UK. Okay. And I presume that most people are holding this for the big prize, um, which is going to be the, the full value of this. Have we seen an uptick in the price of Rutal in terms of the last period of time? What, what's been happening to the price? So, so we have seen a significant uptick in, in the price of Rutal um, due to this deficit, due to this significant deficit of this, this product in the market. So really, you, you spoke about the, 
Uh, I spoke before about the contract market and the spot market. Let, let me just give you a little bit more uh, colour there. So in the contract market, the price has gone up over the last sort of 18 months from about $1,100 US a tonne to about $1,600 US a tonne. So almost, a, uh, sorry, about $1,600 US a tonne. So almost a 50% rise there. Now, in the spot market, which is dominated by the welding industry, uh, we've seen a rise from about $1,400 to well over $2,000, so something like $2,200 uh, or around that level. So purely driven, purely driven by this, this shortage in the market. In terms, of, in terms of this supply deficit, what is the reason for it? The reason is that the existing mines in the world are depleting their reserves and they're either mining lower grade or they're shutting that they've finished and and they're, and they're shutting down. We see enough, we see about somewhere between forty and sixty percent of uh, production coming out of the market over the next five or six years. That's ex excluding our project coming on, of course. So so the deficit is only only getting only getting larger. That that gap in de demand and supply is is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger every every day. Yeah, so in some ways, uh, piling a load on the market's not going to be good for you. You've got to do it in stages, and that, that will get you the most profitability, I would imagine, in terms of this market. Yes, so um, not notwithstanding the, the market is in significant deficit, we have, a, we have completed a scoping study, which is a, which a, a broad economic study, and that um, in the first five years will produce about 145,000 tonnes of brutal. And after year five uh, per year, and after year five, we'll produce about two hundred and sixty thousand tons of rutile per year. So a stage, okay. a stage builder. What is your uh, likely cost of production? Your AISC order. Our cash cost of production is about three hundred and twenty US dollars a ton, and our all-in sustaining cost is around four hundred dollars US a ton. Okay, so you're basically printing US dollars when you start. It it prints money. <laughs> this this project will print money. <laughs> so there's, there, there's no doubt. If 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 I'm an impatient man, when mm. when is the printing of money going to begin? Four years, <laughs> twenty twenty six. We are uh, on uh, on track for for production. Then, so another two years of studies and permitting, and then a financing period, then a construction period, and then we can get into to pulling this good stuff out of the ground and and getting it out to market. Yeah, and at that point, you know, you're you're currently worth, I think, uh, just less than a hundred million pounds. Um, what would you hope is the is the valuation likely on on the initial hundred and fifty million tons? Now, I know you can't tell me exactly. I understand. So, this is like ballpark. What do we think it could be worth based what on the I current think? the current situation? You know, that the Rutal is fourteen hundred dollars, or or sorry, two thousand yeah, I mean dollars. Sure, sure. Well, our, our economic study says the MPV is one point six. The MPV for this project is one point six uh, billion US dollars. So, you know, I, I'd, ra I'd prefer not to put a figure on it. I don't. I'm not sure the regulators like uh, company directors doing no, that. No, they don't. But, they um, don't but I always ask the questions but, anyway. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> so uh, I, I would hope we would be, you know, more than our current market capitalization of, uh, of around 100 million pounds. That that's for sure. I, I would hope we'd be uh, many yeah. times that. Yeah, well, I can say that as well. You're going to be many, many factors of that. I would imagine, you know, uh, producing that, and this is only 30 percent of the uh, the overall resource. So, yeah, and. Really, Malawi wants this. You wouldn't have a president announcing it in the UN if he doesn't want it. So you can be fairly sure that this is going to go ahead, uh, obviously based on finances and the deficit and all those other things. So there's a lot of mining risks that have been reduced in this in, in, in the company. I think it's, uh, you know, if you want a low risk product that if you wait, you're going to get a very nice return. I, I can see this is going to be a great investment. So, yeah. So, Sapam, would you like to add anything? Yeah, look, I uh, I was just listening in on the whole value uh, discussion, which is always uh, always nice to have. Um, what, one uh, point I'll just quickly make, which uh, someone actually made to me yesterday, was around the fact that you know, Casia is so large, as as Julian was talking about, it could be 50, 70, 100 
100 years of mine life. So if you stop looking at this as a as a mining project, you know, you look at your your gold projects that have like 10 years of mine and you can you can do a discounted cash flow and all all, all your funky corporate finance stuff to try and get a value. But if you look at Casilla as a simple industrial mineral producer, I, it, it produces a product that then gets used in a, a, a plethora of industries. And then you hone in on its, you know, the annual EBITDA that we're looking at, again, just off, you know, mining 30% of the, the resource. You're talking well over $300 million a year coming off as, as EBITDA from this project. Now, in a normalized environment, you could expect companies to be trading anywhere between kind of six to eight times their EBITDA number. I mean, depending on the the, the industry, you, you could start talking about, you know, 10 to 14 times, especially when you start getting into tech world, etc. But look, on those on that on that basis, you know, if you then look at today's market cap. Yeah, don't, uh, don't say don't say the numbers happen. Don't say the number, let them do it themselves. Okay? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, let, 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 yeah let's it's, look it's at... a it's a lot times a lot times six yeah, exactly. is where you're training or right. So yeah. so that's a lot. I'm I'm trying to help you here. Don't say it. Um <laughs> but but the the scenario is that actually from what you've just said, you know, in a few years' time, once you've passed the the different um pfs's and the um the actual feasibility study and then the finances you actually become a utility stock i know you were talking about minerals but you then become a utility stock because you've got so much resource that it's almost like electricity or or gas or whatever it happens to be that the resource is just going to keep on coming so you know because you've got such a long shelf life so you're you're totally right and look when you start to uh, start asking about more around where the sovereign metals fit in this whole ecosystem of titanium and titanium dioxide. Um, just very quickly, I'm at the uh, titanium dioxide world summit, which sounds very, very important, but it's basically a few days where any any kind of um, company or corporate that that is uh, affected by the TIO2 industry, they all gather and meet and uh, try and understand where the industry is at and meet, you know, like-minded uh, companies, etc. I, I, I'm at that next week, and uh, you know the the type of companies that are there are Apple, Renault, Jaguar, Land Rover, IKEA, you know a whole bunch of uh, cosmetics companies. So you know there's there's just um, there's there's so much there's such a huge ecosystem as as I like to call it of the titanium dioxide and titanium industry out there. Um, so you're right. Once you start thinking of sovereign metals as just a piece of that puzzle, it does very much start to feel like a utility. OK, so thank you. We look forward to uh, more news, more uh, things going on with uh, with you guys. Thank you, Julian, for joining us all the way from Australia. Thank, thank you, you Sapan. And uh, we just have one question that we have to ask you, uh, Julian. Sure. You are, you're on the midweek takeaway. So if you had to have a midweek takeaway, from the shop, um, I presume with a tinny because you're in Australia. Um, <laughs> what what would it be? Well, we've got a little brewery uh, down here in a, in a port town called Fremantle called Little Creatures. So I suppose it would I suppose it would be a pint of Little Creatures. Okay, and what would you eat with that? Uh, fish and chips, of course. Fish and <laughs> pretty chips. British, pretty British. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay, again, thank you for joining us on the Midweek Takeaway and we look forward to speaking to you soon. Thanks so much, Kevin. Great to chat. Thanks, Kevin. This podcast was brought to you by Roast PR Limited. If you would like to appear on a future episode of The Sunday Roast, please email admin at thesundayroast.net.